2020 has been a year of firsts, not all of them good. But in keeping with that tradition, we're starting today's show with the first for the United Nations General Assembly. I'm Carl Azus, this is CNN 10. This year marks the 75th anniversary of when the United Nations was established. And this week marks the beginning of the UN General Assembly, an annual meeting at the UN headquarters in New York City. Representatives, often the leaders of the UN's 193 member countries, are there to publicly address global cooperation, global concerns, global problems. This is what the event usually looks like, with as many as 2,500 people assembled in one room. That's under normal circumstances. But for the first time in the organization's history, its meeting is happening online this week out of concerns over the spread of coronavirus. Roughly 210 people, less than one-tenth of what you'd normally see, are expected in the assembly hall. Their role to introduce the videotaped speeches of their leaders. Those recordings and virtual meetings will replace the large gatherings and sideline get-togethers. There will be no in-person lobbying, no power lunches, diplomacy has gone online. And while Tuesday's speakers alone included the leaders of the United States, China, Russia, France, Iran, and all of them within hours, there's no way to gauge audience reactions or to know who's watching live. And the Secretary General of the United Nations, the leader of the organization, says for diplomacy to be effective, person-to-person -person contact is needed. So it's hard to say how much will get accomplished through this year's UN General Assembly. But the event still has a list of topics it plans to address. Armed conflict, hunger, poverty and racism are among them. So is the elephant in the room, the coronavirus pandemic. Scientists around the world continue their race to find antibody treatments and drugs to fight the disease. The quest to develop a widely approved vaccine continues. But even that's only a step in the pandemic. Getting it to people will be the next challenge. Pharmaceutical companies are inching closer to the finish line. There are over 170 vaccine candidates around the world. Eight are in the final stage of human trials. Proving them to be effective, safe and achieve regulatory approval isn't the only challenge. We have to go from there to actually having billions of doses of vaccine uh, that can be delivered to people around the world. We're investing in the process of manufacturing before we even know whether a given vaccine will reach licensure and could be used. Governments around the world have committed billions of dollars to vaccine makers, buying up hundreds of millions of vaccine doses, which may not even work. Pfizer, in partnership with BioNTech, plans to make 100 million doses of its vaccine candidate by the end of the year, and over a billion next. Well, it is absolutely not normal. It's unprecedented. To try and meet that demand, Pfizer has set up separate manufacturing in the US and Europe and is drawing on all its resources. Making the vaccine isn't the end of the challenge. Next up, getting it to those that need it all over the world. Companies like UPS plan to be ready to pick up, store and deliver a successful vaccine. Different types of vaccine need different transport and storage conditions. One of the biggest challenges is temperature. Keeping the vaccine safe and secure is critical and UPS plans to have 24-7 tracking for every single vial. 10 second trivia. What occurs when the sun crosses Earth's equator? Solar eclipse, equinox, daylight saving time, or solstice? When this happens, day and night are the same length and an equinox is occurring. It's fall, y'all. At least it is in the Northern Hemisphere. Yesterday marked the second equinox of the year, which signals the advent of autumn if you live north of the equator and the start of spring if you live south of it. The term equinox comes from the Latin word equinoxium. And yes, I wrote that in because I wanted to say equinoxium. It means equality between day and night. And that's what people saw yesterday, no matter where they live. It doesn't make much difference if you live on or very near the equator. Your days and nights are roughly the same length year-round. But the farther you live from the equator, the more you're going to notice the changes in daylight for the months ahead. Folks in northern Canada, Norway, and Russia are going to see a long, dark winter with minimal sunshine. 
Their daylight hours in the summer are the opposite. If the descent into darker months gets them down, though, they have this as their consolation prize. The aurora borealis, or northern lights, are usually more active during the equinoxes, according to a solar physicist interviewed by CNN. Most of the world's population, an estimated 90%, lives in the northern hemisphere. And many of them are looking forward to the change of scenery that comes with the change of seasons. The term leaf peeping, you often hear it from say September through November, and it's that informal term given to people who travel vast distances to get a glimpse of the fall colors. Certainly can feel the cool temperatures outside, you can see the splash of colors beginning to take place. But why does this all happen? I want you to think about leaves on a tree as essentially mini solar panels. What they're able to do is fascinating. They are taking the sunlight in, and through a process known as photosynthesis, they're able to transfer the sun's energy and create a chemical known as chlorophyll. Now, chlorophyll is key because it gives the leaves its green colors during the long summer months, but beneath the surface, the leaves actually always have the reds, the oranges, the yellows in place. While chlorophyll is there, it's there and it's green. While it's taken away in the shorter days and shorter months of the autumn, now you're releasing some of the true colors back to the surface. Of course, weather can play a role in this as well, especially in the vibrancy of it. When you have plenty of rainfall in the growing season or in the spring season, you're able to get plenty of good colors in early September, October, and November. If you have extreme heat, extreme drought in place, maybe a freeze, an early snowstorm, or even strong winds, certainly that can do damage. The leaves will not be there for you to see them in peak foliage. So hopefully you have a chance to get out there this year and enjoy the fall colors. We're going to spend the last part of today's show talking about tug of war. Now you might be like, dude, how long can you talk about that? Well, I'll start with history. According to time.com, tug of war used to be an Olympic sport. From 1900 to 1920, teams of eight men tried to drag their opponents over a certain distance. If neither team could get the upper hand or foot, whoever made the most progress won. And one of the most successful countries at this was Britain, whose City of London police officers proved opponents couldn't escape the long arm or the strong arm of the law. Now, some people might think of tug of war as a game for summer camp or county fairs, but a group of folks in Brooklyn, Wisconsin, hopes to drag the sport into the 21st century. Ready! <laughs> Tyler! Tug of war is the ultimate team sport. If one man goes down, he can take the whole team down with him. Because you have to have eight pullers working in unison as one. Keep that, keep that, keep that. <laughs> to the general public, they think tug of war may be just a game in high school. Oh, keep it low. In serious competition, there's strict rules and guidelines. And only the top athletes in the countries are get to that level. Center. If you're going into a rope pull, you might be the strongest person in the world, but if your head isn't in it, you're going to lose. Your legs are the strongest muscles in your body, and they can push 400 pounds easy, and you got to transfer that through your hands. They're not allowed to wear gloves. They can only put the tack on. Calluses build up. I call, I call them square fingers because you, you, you get the edges pushed. Try it again. Set. Well, the reason the tug of war was ousted from the Olympics is that they were cutting sports. So they dropped it, and that's been the fight to get it back in. I hope to see it back in the Olympics because I believe it deserves to be there. I'm representing the US. And I take a, a lot of pride in trying to do the best job I possibly can. So anyone could get roped in, pulled in, dragged in, towed in, hauled in, strung along, and find the whole idea moving. Does it tug at your heartstrings? It certainly seems to have a draw, even if it doesn't end in one. I'm Carl Azus, Santa Rita High School. We see you. Shout out to our viewers in Tucson, Arizona. We'll see you tomorrow on CNN 10.